Now, brothers and sisters, it gives me great pleasure on your behalf to invite our brother John to come forward and give us his talk on the work of Elijah. Brother John. Good afternoon, brothers and sisters. Elijah's work will be to prepare the Jews to meet the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's through his preparation that they will recognize the Lord Jesus Christ as their Messiah. His role will be to restore all things. Verse 6 of Malachi chapter 4 that we've just read makes clear that he will go out to turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the children to the fathers. And so he's trying to bring Israel back to the promises made to the fathers. And we suggest from verse 4 of this chapter that he's doing that by showing them the promises in the law of Moses. Now, when John the Baptist went before the Lord Jesus Christ's first coming, he was working in the spirit and power of Elijah. In other words, John was foreshadowing this great work that we want to look at. Elijah's role will be to turn the heart to the fathers to the children and the children to the fathers. And you'll see from, from Luke that that involves, as we've just been able to see from your laps and from the reference in Luke on the screen, that in getting the children back to the fathers, that involves getting them back to the wisdom of the just. Now, the wisdom of the just is surely faith. The just shall live by faith. Key, key verse in Scripture. And it's a theme which starts with faithful Abraham in Genesis chapter 15. That is where you find those two words, just and faith, first coming up. They then come through into Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 4. Then come into Romans, Galatians and Hebrews to show us that the just shall live by faith. So John's work was a type of the future work which Elijah will accomplish. So much so that the Lord Jesus described John as Elijah which is to come. Now, John understood that he wasn't Elijah. In fact, when people went to him and said, are you Elijah? He clearly said, I am not. But we'll see John was foreshadowing the work of Elijah as a voice crying in the wilderness. A voice crying in the wilderness. And those words hopefully will echo through as we go through this study together. I'd like you now, please, to come forward to Matthew chapter 17, where Elijah and Moses appeared during the transfiguration. And during the transfiguration, we know actually from Luke's gospel that they were talking about an exodus. But here in Matthew 17, it's recorded in verse 10, that the disciples asked the Lord Jesus, this is after the transfiguration, which has happened at the beginning of the chapter. The disciples asked him, saying, Why then say the scribes that Elijah must first come? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Elijah truly shall first come and restore all things. But I say unto you that Elias is come already, and they knew him not, but have done unto him whatsoever they listed. Likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer of them. Then the disciples understood that he spoke unto them of John the Baptist. So the disciples say, the scribes say that Elijah will come first. And Jesus says, they're right, he will. He has a role to restore all things. But speaking of John the Baptist, I I think Jesus is saying here, they've rejected the one that was fulfilling that role. John was a type of Elijah to come. He was working to prepare the Jews for the Lord Jesus Christ. And this summarizes the work of Elijah. Now, looking back at uh, the first few verses of this chapter, we see there Moses and Elijah speaking with the Lord Jesus Christ during the transfiguration in verse 3. Behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Uh, And as I mentioned, we know from Luke chapter 9 that at that time they spoke of the Lord Jesus Christ's exodus. Now, we would suggest that those two men, Moses and Elijah, would be able to input into that because, of course, Moses had already led an exodus. The Lord Jesus Christ was about to lead the greatest exodus of all, leading us from sin. And Elijah has a future role in leading an exodus. 
He will be the prophet that starts off the work of preaching to the Jews in the kingdom age. Now, I'd like, brothers and sisters, please, to come back to 1 Kings 17, which is where the historical record about Elijah begins. 1 Kings chapter 17. And although we're not going to spend too much time here, we'd like to briefly go through and make some points that hopefully can help us to learn some more about the work which Elijah will do. And hopefully helps you to see why we're confident to suggest that this same Elijah will undertake the work yet to come. In 1 Kings 17, you will remember, I'm sure, that Elijah brings to life a child through breathing into him. And uh, you can read through that in verse 20 and 21 of uh, 1 Kings 17. Now, the reason that struck me as fascinating is because Ezekiel describes the resurrection of Israel as a nation having breath breathed back into them in that valley of dry bones. We also note from this chapter that this took place in Zarephath. Now, Zarephath means refinement. And interestingly, in Malachi 3, when we're told that a messenger will precede the Lord Jesus, i.e. the work of Elijah, it says of the Lord Jesus that he will be like a refiner's fire. Zarephath means refinement. In chapter 18, when Elijah is having to battle it out with the prophets of Baal, you remember that in verse 31, Elijah took 12 stones according to the tribes of the sons of Jacob, unto whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. And there he built an altar. But I think it's interesting that he took 12 stones. We read, didn't we, in Matthew 17, just a moment ago, that he will restore all things. I think Elijah has a work with all of the tribes of Israel, despite the fact that here he was just a prophet to the northern tribes. He will restore all things. Notice also his prayer in verse 37. And it starts in verse 36, I'm sorry. Verse 36 and 37. And again, surely this is highly significant after what we've read in Malachi 4. Because here we've got Elijah trying to turn the heart. You can see that at the end of verse 37, the idea of the turning of the heart. And what's he trying to turn them to? Well, in verse 36, O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, turning the hearts of the children to the fathers. And you see how this work that he's already done was a preparation for him of the work that is yet to come. As the fire then comes down onto the altar, and you recognize I'm just going through this kind of point by point, knowing that uh, you, you know this story well. As the fire comes down and, uh, and consumes everything that's there, I want you to notice what the people shout out in verse 39. When all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, Yahweh, he is the God. The Lord, he is the God. And I want you to to remember that because we're going to see that echoed in in later chapters when we're seeing some of his future work. As the name Zarephath was significant, so too we think the names in this chapter have significance. This took place in Carmel. And Carmel means fruitful field or garden. The place where Elijah then loses confidence right at the end of this chapter. And right at the last word of this chapter in verse 46, Jezreel we're also going to see the significance of that, which means God sows. Perhaps a final idea that we could just bring out of this chapter is that you'll grasp uh, this quite quickly, I think, that at the end here, we've got Elijah as a forerunner to a king. That's what we've got, haven't we? At the end of this chapter, we've got Elijah as a forerunner to the king, going in the spirit of God. Surely that, brothers and sisters, is a significant thing to bring up. And to me, it's thrilling But the the tragedy here, at this point in history, Elijah from this point gives up just here, believing that only he is left. And he's left running from this woman, Jezebel, a witch of a woman associated with false religions and whoredoms. And yet wonderfully, as we'll see later, the threat of Jezebel will not stop Elijah trying to convert in the future. Elijah will have immortal strength when dealing with the threat of Jezebel-type systems. And in another beautiful scriptural echo, we see here 
a cloud coming up like the like, like, like a man's hand. You see that at the end of verse or halfway through verse 44, pronouncing judgment on that system. Well, isn't it lovely that in Daniel 5, Daniel tells that the story of the literal fall of Babylon. And you remember there that the fingers of a man's hand came up and uh, pronounced judgment on that grim system. Elijah with us will see the fall of figurative Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. Now in chapter 19, we see how an angel then gives him sustenance to get him to Horeb, a journey which takes him some 40 days and 40 nights. Coming at verse 7, the angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched Elijah saying, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. And he arose and did eat and drink and went in the strength of that meat 40 days and 40 nights unto Horeb the Mount of God. As he makes this journey, it seems that God is working to draw Elijah's mind to the experience of Moses. And the significance of this is that, as we'll see, and as we tried to point out a little bit already, Elijah will be bringing about an exodus as Moses had previously done. So God draws Elijah's mind to Moses. And this is why we believe that Elijah was there speaking with Moses during the transfiguration about the Lord Jesus Christ, Exodus. Come in now at verse 11 to see Elijah still on the mount as the Lord passed by. It says here that the God said to him, go forth, stand upon the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by and a great and strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind, and after the wind an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake, and after the earthquake a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire, and after the fire a still small voice. Why? Why was Elijah put through this? Well, I wonder if it's for two reasons. The first is because God is telling Elijah that dreadful things have got to happen before the sound of gentle stillness. We'll see in a moment when we turn to prophecies regarding the return of the Jews, the momentous events described in terms of earthquakes, wind and fire, will precede the peace of the kingdom age. But the second reason we believe is because Elijah needed to learn that his role would not be in the dramatic things, but rather the voice, the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Through the still small voice of the word, Elijah will be converting the Jews, demonstrating through the scriptures that Jesus really is the Messiah. Now, having set that background, I'd like to go back to Malachi chapter 4, please. And hopefully, having gone through some of those points, we'll be helped in picking up echoes in the prophets. So now back in Malachi, chapter 4 and verse 5, where it says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. We realize evidently that Elijah needs to come before the great and dreadful day of the Lord, which we're confident is speaking of the events of Armageddon, a huge national judgment in the vicinity of Jerusalem. The passage also makes clear that Elijah's teaching will avert a curse. You see this at the end of verse 6. He's going to come, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Now, clearly, Armageddon was a curse. We know that because it's described as such in Zechariah 14 in verse 11, which I put on the screen. But Elijah comes before Armageddon. So, So he doesn't avert that curse. So if it's not Armageddon, what curse does Elijah revert? Well, the word translated, the word translated uh, curse is also translated utterly destroyed. It's in here in 1 Samuel 15 in verse 21. When Saul, as the first king of Israel, was told to go and utterly destroy the Amalekites. And so my suggestion, brethren and sisters, is that As the Lord Jesus Christ sets up the kingdom, 
The land would have had to be utterly destroyed by him, cursed by him, if there was no faith. If Elijah's teaching hadn't turned a remnant. And this would add to the terribleness of Armageddon, but it would be necessary to purge the land before the setting up of the kingdom. However, because of Elijah's teaching, the Lord Jesus Christ returns to Jerusalem as a saviour to that faithful remnant. And therefore, would expect Jesus' return to happen, the same sort of uh, timeline as Brother Ken put up, but uh, his slides were just a bit more fancy. You see here, though, that uh, the Lord Jesus Christ would have had to return to the earth, the resurrection would have happened, the judgment must happen, and then Elijah will be sent out to begin his work, going first to Judah. And through his teaching of the law of Moses, he'll demonstrate to the Jews who listen that Jesus really was the Christ, the messenger of the new covenant, the fulfillment of the promises made to the fathers. His teaching will be so powerful that when the judgments of Armageddon come, which will of course be an enormous trial of faith for those who have been turned, a third will come through that terrible time. So it's a flick back now to Zechariah 13 to see that. Zechariah 13, and it says in verse 9, I will bring the third part through the fire and will refine them as silver is refined and will try them as gold is tried. They shall call on my name and I will hear them. I will say it is my people and they shall say the Lord is my God. You see the echoes there into 1 Kings 18. In chapter 12 and verse 10 we, we see there how the, the Jews in Jerusalem at this time will Weep when they realise what they have done to the Lord Jesus Christ. When they look on him, they have pierced, they will mourn. And I think to the end of the chapter there shows their genuine tears of repentance as they look to Jesus as their Messiah. But we notice in chapter 13, in that verse we just read in verse 9, that the prophet described their trying as of gold. Now, if gold is signifying tried faith, then teaching from the word must have happened in my mind. Why do we say that? Well, faith comes from the word of God. And remember, he is getting them back to the wisdom of the just. The just shall live by faith. Now, they've got to get this faith from somewhere. And faith, we've been told, comes from the word of God. Now, as an aside, I think it's lovely that in James 5, James speaks of the work of Elijah And then says, he which converteth a sinner from the air of his way shall save a soul from death. This is in the context of him speaking about Elijah. Now the word convert there is the same word, turn, when it's talking about the work of Elijah in Luke 1 and verse 17, that he will turn the hearts of the fathers. He's converting them. How is he converting them? He's converting them through the word. That's how they're going to get their faith. Uh, And we're confident of that as well because James 1 has explained earlier how a sin, how a soul is saved from death. A soul is saved from death by this. Receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. So by his teaching from the word of God, from the law of Moses, that's what's going to appeal to the Jews, isn't it? He's going to show them that the Lord Jesus Christ is the Messiah. And through that, he will save souls from death, delivering them, of course, from the ultimate curse. Now, you remember when Elijah turned the people at Carmel, they called out, Yahweh, he is my God. And right at the end of chapter 13, those in the land are now saying, that last phrase in chapter 13, Yahweh, the Lord, is my God. What's more, brethren and sisters, I don't think for a moment that Elijah's work will stop here. The Lord Jesus said, Elijah will come and restore all things. There are Jews who are scattered So these are the Jews in the land that he's been able to go to so far and and speak to them about the judgments that are going to come and and help them through his teaching of the word. But there are Jews all around the earth who haven't been touched by this teaching yet. And so I'm sure that Elijah then, perhaps even before Jesus comes to Jerusalem, will be sent out to these scattered Jews. Wherever Elijah goes, the impact will be great. You can imagine the rabbis coming together now grasping from the law that the promises made to the fathers were centred in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the word will spread, no doubt. 
And those who are genuine will be converted. Scattered Jews throughout the world will be returning to the land of their fathers because of this work. An exodus will begin. And as those Jews scattered around the world begin to return to the land, many Gentiles will want to be associated with them, realising that there's life in the hope of Israel. Come forward to Romans chapter 11. Romans 11, famous, famous chapter, isn't it, about the restoration of Israel. And you notice that the beginning of this chapter, this famous chapter, starts by drawing your mind to Elijah. But here in Romans 11, we think that it's lovely to realise that he is going to be involved in the restoration of all Israel. Now you see in verse 12 how it makes clear that the Gentiles will benefit from the restoration of Israel. It says, now, if the fall of them, the fall of the Jews, be the riches of the world, and the diminishing of them, the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? So, as the Jews come back into the land, that is going to be a huge benefit to the Gentiles. So we're just getting a pattern, there's a pattern right through scripture, that the gospel is going to go in the kingdom to the Jews first and then to the Gentiles. That's a, a scriptural pattern of how preaching should go. But while we're in this chapter, I want you to pick up that verse 8, just uh, have a look down at verse 8, is a citation from Isaiah 29. So hopefully you can pick that up from your margin and, and perhaps circle it. And uh, now we'd like to go back to Isaiah 29. So we've picked up this chapter about the restoration of Israel, Romans 11, cites Isaiah 29. Now the passage quoted is in Isaiah 29 in verse, 30, uh, verse 10, sorry, and you'll be able to again just see that in your margin hopefully. <laughs> It says, for the Lord hath poured out upon you the spirit of deep sleep and hath closed your eyes. The prophets and your rulers, the seers, hath he covered. Israel is now asleep, blind to the teaching of scripture. But a time will come when this changes. Verse 17, is it not yet a very little while? And Lebanon shall be turned into a fruitful field. And the fruitful field shall be established as a forest. And in that day shall the deaf hear the words of the book, and the eyes of the blind shall see out of obscurity and out of darkness. We may say, well, well, why does Lebanon interest us? Well, well, this is where Elijah's work began. Zidon, where he went up in 1 Kings 17, is in Lebanon. This is a poetic picture of this work. And that will be turned into a fruitful field. And do you know what the Hebrew for fruitful field is? It's Carmel. Be turned into Carmel. This is the work of Elijah, brethren and sisters, turning blind Israel. Look at verse uh, 22. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, who redeemed Abraham concerning the house of Jacob, Jacob shall not now be ashamed, neither shall his face now wax pale. But when he sees his children, what's he going to do? Elijah's work is to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the, the, the children to the fathers. Here are the fathers looking at the children. This is his work. When he sees his children, the work of mine hands in the midst of him, they shall sanctify my name and sanctify the Holy One of Jacob and shall fear the God of Israel. They also that erred in spirit shall come to understanding and they that murmured shall learn doctrine. This is the work of Elijah and what a lovely picture it is. But we're not mistaken to think that terrible events have also to happen. Look at verse 6 and 7. Thou shalt be visited of the Lord of hosts with thunder, with earthquake, great noise, and whirlwind, and tempest, and the flame of devouring fire. Great destruction would need to happen. The events of Armageddon, terrible judgment, earthquake, wind, and fire. But as the Lord Jesus Christ, with many saints, are working to establish Jerusalem as the capital city of God's kingdom on earth, Elijah, and I believe a company of messengers with him, are working to turn scattered Israel. Turn now to Zechariah chapter 10, please. Zechariah 
you'll see now in Zechariah chapter 10 that there is a distinction made between the Jews in the land, the house of Judah, and those Jews scattered, referred to as Israel or or Joseph or or Ephraim here. We're going at verse 3. Mine anger was kindled against the shepherds, and I will punish, sorry, I punish the goats. For the Lord of hosts hath visited his flock, the house of Judah, and hath made them as his goodly horse in the battle. Out of him came forth the corner, out of him the nail, out of him the battle bow, out of him every oppressor together. And they shall be as mighty men which tread down their enemies in the mire of the street in the battle. And they shall fight because the Lord is with them, and the riders on horses shall be confounded. And I will strengthen the house of Judah, and I will save the house of Joseph, and will bring them again to this place. For I have mercy upon them, and they shall be as though I had not cast them off, for I am the Lord their God, and will hear them. And they of Ephraim shall be like a mighty man, and their heart shall rejoice as through wine. Yea, their children shall see it and be glad, their heart shall rejoice in the Lord. I will hiss for them, and gather them, for I have redeemed them, and they shall increase as they have increased. And I will sow them among the people, and they shall remember me in far countries, and they shall live with their children, and turn again. The remnant in Judah is now converted. The Lord Jesus has saved them from the northern invader. And so now they are working with the Lord Jesus Christ and the saints to defend the land. And perhaps they too are involved in the preaching work to scattered Israel, as God hisses for them. The the idea of hissing is that of a shepherd whistling, calling for his sheep. And as sheep will willingly come to their shepherd, so too scattered Israel will be willing to return. This lovely verse in Psalm 110, Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. In the beauty of holiness from the womb of the morning, thou hast the dew of thy youth. Now the phrase in verse 9 though here in Zechariah chapter 10, I will sow them among the people. Is a lovely picture of this work of restoration. And our margins will have a cross-reference to Hosea 2. Now we're going to come back to Zechariah 10 in a moment, but come back to Hosea 2 first, please. And if this chapter doesn't get you excited, I don't know what will. This is just thrilling. Hosea 2, and like to go in at verse 12. God says, I will destroy her vines and her fig trees, whereof she has said, These are my rewards that my lover hath given me. And I will make them a forest, and the beasts of the field shall eat them. Do you know, just seeing that verse alone, I suddenly thought, This is talking about the work of Elijah. Why? Well, the one person we know in Scripture who wanted the rewards of vineyards was Ahab. That his lover, Jezebel, gave him. Surely we see echoes just in that verse 12 that Elijah's work could well be referred to here. He was the very king that Elijah had to battle with. It was given to him by his lover, Jezebel. Going on, though... To speak of Israel being turned, we get a a beautiful description. So so come now in at verse uh, 14. It says, Therefore I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak comfortably unto her. And I will give her her vineyards from thence and the valley of Achor for a door of hope. And she shall sing there as in the days of her youth and as in the days when she came up out of the land of Egypt. And and it shall be in that day, saith the Lord, they shall call me Ishi and shall call me no more Bali. For I will make, take away the names of Balaam out of her mouth, and they shall no more be remembered by their name. And in that day will I make a covenant for them with the beasts of the field and with the fowls of heaven and with the creeping things of the ground. And I will break the bow and the sword and the battle out of the earth, and I will make them to lie down safely. And I will betroth thee unto me forever. Yea, I will tro- betroth thee unto me in righteousness and in judgment and in loving kindness and in mercies. I will even betroth thee unto me in faithfulness, and thou shalt know the Lord. And it shall come to pass in that day, I will hear, saith the Lord. I will hear the heavens, and they shall hear the earth. And the earth shall hear the corn, and the wine, and the oil. And they shall hear Jezreel. The place Elijah gave up is being turned by God into something incredible. As people now come into the new covenant... 
And we know it's talking about the new covenant because, for a start, it's one that lasts forever. Uh, And you see in verse 19 that it's a covenant to do with righteousness and judgment. That's the, the covenant that was promised to Abraham in Genesis 18 in verse 19. You see that it's a covenant which is based on faith. You see that in verse 20. This is the Jews coming into the new covenant now. The valley of Achor is being turned into a door of hope. And your margin against Achor in verse 15 will tell you that the word Achor means troubling. Remember Ahab accused Elijah of troubling Israel. Elijah, though, says to Ahab, No, I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house, in that you have forsaken the commandment of the Lord, and thou hast followed Balaam. And God is now saying, I'll visit those days upon you, verse 13. I will visit upon you the days of Balaam. Isn't it interesting, the references, the cross-reference are able to pick up and see that here is the, the work of Elijah being spoken of. Your margin for speak comfortably in verse 14. I'll bring her into the wilderness and speak comfortably. We'll say that the Hebrew there is to the heart. And again, you'll remember that Elijah's work is to turn the heart to the fathers, to the children and the children to the fathers. We see from verse 15 that it will be as in the day when she came up out of the land of Egypt. It's an exodus which is being spoken of here. And what's more, we realize from this amazing passage of scripture The Gentiles too are involved. Why are we saying that so confidently? Well, in verse 18, that the list of beasts and mini beasts and bugs, these things are the very things that Peter saw in Acts chapter 10 being told that the gospel would go to the Gentiles. The fullness of Israel will be a great help to the Gentiles. And so no wonder it says in places like Zechariah 8, in those days it shall come to pass that ten men shall take hold out of all languages of the nations even shall take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, saying, we will go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. Or Isaiah 56, and I haven't put it on the screen, but in your margin, put it down. It's a passage that's saying the same thing. The Gentiles will grab hold of them and want to go with them, saying there is life in the hope of Israel. God will plead with his people through the work of the prophet Elijah. And those who respond would join an exodus, heading to the promised land, where they'll be brought into the new covenant. You remember how the apostle in 1 Corinthians 10 describes the national baptism of Israel into Moses. And it could be that something similar takes place during this exodus. If you again return to Zechariah 10, I said we need to go back there. So come back to Zechariah 10 and we'll go back in where we left off. We left off in verse 9, but look now at verse 10. It says, I will bring them again also out of the land of Egypt and gather them out of Assyria, and I will bring them into the land of Gilead and Lebanon, and place shall not be found for them. And he shall pass through the sea with affliction and shall smite the waves in the sea. And all the deeps of the river shall dry up, and the pride of Assyria shall be brought down, and the scepter of Egypt shall depart away. And I will strengthen them in the Lord. And they shall walk up and down in his name, saith the Lord. And so the the initial territory of the kingdom will now be established, which is the land which was promised to Abraham in Genesis 15, from the Nile to the river Euphrates. And you're seeing from this passage here in Zechariah 10 that they're able to come in now into this kingdom territory. This is the beginning of the kingdom before God's glory has completely covered the earth, of course. Right at the beginning, this territory will start in Jerusalem and, and begin to build out. And now these Jews are able to come in to this safe haven uh, once they've crossed over those rivers. So we almost get a a kind of picture of them coming in by faith uh, and and baptism into the new covenant. And as in the first Exodus, they'll be given safe passage. Isaiah 11 says, The Lord shall utterly destroy the tongue of the Egyptian sea, and with his mighty wind shall he shake his hand over the river, and shall smite it in the seven streams and and make men go over dry shod. And there shall be an highway for the remnant of his people, which shall be left from Assyria, like as it was to Israel in the day when he came up out of the land of Egypt. You remember again stunning passages like Isaiah 35 that speaks of that highway that will be there. So they're able to get, once they're there, they're coming in and they've got safe passage to come up to Jerusalem. And those brought into the new covenant will be given places to live 
as the land will be split into the 12 tribe territories. And it may be that, uh, and I, I, so much of this talk, Brennan Sister, I, I hope I don't come across dogmatic. I'm hugely excited from the things that are, uh, I've studied and in looking at this. But it, it may well be that they, they go to via Sinai. Uh, there's a passage in Ezekiel 20 which speaks of them going to the wilderness and there the rebels being purged. Uh, and, and before they go up to, to Jerusalem and then given into the, the, the territories which are detailed for us at the end of Ezekiel as to where they might be able to live in their tribes. But I'd like to also note from here in Zechariah 10 that we're told that initially they'll come into the land of Gilead. Do you notice that in verse 10? I want to hold that thought. But come now, please, to Jeremiah chapter 3. Here in Jeremiah 3, we see another of these lovely passages regarding this work still to come. It says in verse 14, Jeremiah 3, verse 14, Turn, O backsliding children, saith the Lord, for I am married unto you, and I will take you out of a city, two of a family, and I will bring you to Zion, and I will give you pastors, shepherds, according to my heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. And it shall come to pass, when ye be multiplied and increased in the land in those days, saith the Lord, they shall no more say no more the ark of the covenant of the Lord, neither shall it come to mind, neither shall they remember it, neither shall they visit it, neither shall that be done any more. At that time they shall call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord, and all the nations shall be gathered unto it, to the name of the Lord, to Jerusalem. Neither shall they walk any more after the imagination of their evil heart. In those days the house of Judah shall walk with the house of Israel, and they shall come together out of the land of the north, to the land that I have given for an inheritance unto your fathers. What a stunning passage that is. And the word in verse, uh, uh, where is it, the word heal is what I'm looking for. I've just managed to lose it. Um, Verse 22. Return ye backsliding children and I will heal your backsliding. That word heal is the same word in 1 Kings 18 and verse 30 when Elijah repaired the broken altar. That word heal in verse 22 is the same word repaired when Elijah repaired the altar. And those involved are described here as pastors or shepherds in verse 15. You remember the hiss of Zechariah chapter 10. There are people here after God's own heart who will feed scattered Israel with knowledge and understanding. And this is why I think that Elijah's like to be involved with the company going out, messengers to those people. But you see, brothers and sisters, that what these shepherds are doing, it says in verse 15, they shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. And so our preaching work today should be us looking to feed people with the word of God. We don't need to worry about anything dramatic. God will see to the earthquake, to the wind, to the fire. Our role is to concentrate on being the still, small voice, demonstrating from the word of God that the Lord Jesus is the Christ. Finally, brothers and sisters, I'd like to turn to Jeremiah 30. Jeremiah 30 and 31. Because here the prophet Jeremiah sees a picture of the return of Israel. And he sees it in a dream. And we know it's a dream because in chapter 31 and verse 26, we're told that he awoke from his sleep. We also know that his dream is far-reaching. Because verse 31 of chapter 31 explicitly says that Israel will be brought into the new covenant. This is something that he's seeing which is detailing future things when eventually Israel will come into the new covenant, the covenant in which we are a part of. This is yet to happen. What Jeremiah sees in his dream is a picture of Jacob returning from Haran. You remember when he was up north in Haran? 
And when Jacob did return, he had to cross the river Euphrates, which is interesting. And he came into Gilead. We know that from Genesis 31 and verse 21. That when Jacob returned, he came through over the, uh, the river Euphrates and he came into Gilead. Why Gilead? Well, that's a pattern for the future, isn't it? Zechariah said that they will be brought to Gilead. It's surely no coincidence, and this blew me away, that this is where Elijah was from. Elijah the Tishbite, who was the inhabitants of Gilead. And Gilead means witness. It's lovely to think that Elijah's work is all about the witness of the Jews. That's what it's about. The restoration is a witness of the Jews. The Gentiles will see that if God can have mercy on them, then surely they too, the Gentiles, can be saved. Which is why ten men will grab hold of the skirts of him that is a Jew and say, we will go with you. Which is why Romans 11 says, how much more? When the Jews have come in, will the Gentiles benefit too? But back now here in Jeremiah, in Jeremiah 30, we see how in this beautiful way, Jeremiah sees Jacob's return as prophetic of the time when scattered Israel will return to the land. Come back to chapter 30 and verse 7. Now we obviously can't go into too much detail here, but we're going to just pick up the fact that you see that he is seeing Jacob in this. Verse 7, alas for that day is great. So that none is like unto it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble. But he shall be saved out of it. Verse 10. Therefore fear thou not, O my servant Jacob, saith the Lord. Neither be dismayed, O Israel. For lo, I will save thee from afar. And thy seed from the land of their captivity. And Jacob shall return. And shall be in rest and quiet. And none shall make him afraid. Or verse 18. Thus saith the Lord. Behold, I will bring again the captivity of Jacob's tents. And have mercy on his dwelling places. And the city shall be builded upon her own heap, and the palace shall remain after the manner thereof. Uh, and if you turn then into uh, chapter 31, you'll see this is continued. This idea of him seeing the return of the Jews in the light of Jacob returning from Haran. It says in verse 7 of chapter 31, Thus saith the Lord, Sing with gladness for Jacob, and shout among the chief of the nations, Publish ye, praise ye, and say, O Lord, save thy people, the remnant of Israel. Behold, I will bring them from the north country and gather them from the coast of the earth. And with them the blind and the lame and the woman with child and her that travaileth with child together. A great company shall they return thither. And, and again, this continues in verse 11. You remember how Jacob was scared of Esau when he came in. But here it says in verse 11, The Lord hath redeemed Jacob and ransomed him from the hand of him that was stronger than he. And you remember that when these things worked out, Jacob described having seen Esau as having seen God face to face. In other words, he realized God was at work in Esau for him to have safe passage. And so too, those Jews returning will realize God's hand at work as they're able to come into the land. But back here in Jeremiah, I want us to, to see how Jeremiah sees this regathering in his dream. Coming at verse 15, Thus saith the Lord, a voice was heard in Rama, lamentation and bitter weeping. Rachel, weeping for her children, refused to be comforted for her children because they were not. And so we see this horrible, terrible picture, really, of Rachel and how distraught she was when her, her children were scattered. But now is the ultimate regathering. So the prophet goes on, verse 16, Thus saith the Lord, Refrain thy voice from weeping, and thy eyes from tears. For thy work shall be rewarded, saith the Lord, and they shall come again from the land of the enemy. And there is hope in thy latter end, saith the Lord, and thy children shall come again to their own border. I have surely heard Ephraim bemoaning himself thus, Thou hast chastised me, and I was chastised. As a calf, and that's the word, a calf unaccustomed to the yoke, Turn thou me, and I shall be turned, for thou art the Lord my God. And it is what a beautiful picture he's seeing here of Jacob of Israel coming back and realizing that they needed to be chastised. And now saying, but turn me, and I will be turned. And then look in verse 19. Surely after that I was turned, I repented. And after that I was instructed. 
There's instruction that has to go on first. After that, I smote upon my thigh. Why would he go to his thigh? Because, of course, when Jacob made that journey, his trust in God dipped. And so an angel put his face, put his, sorry, his, his thigh out of joint to remind him to trust in God and not in himself. And so it was that all his days, Jacob had to lean upon a staff, a constant reminder that he couldn't trust in his own strength. And now as Jeremiah sees this stunning vision, he's seeing scattered Israel come back. And as they come, their hand automatically goes to the thigh. Because the Lord Jesus Christ is now going to heal it. Do you know the description that he gave himself of a calf there in verse 18? The the A.B. says bullock. That's apt. Because that's the same word in Malachi 4, where it says, Unto you that fear my name, shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. Brothers and sisters, I'm sure that Elijah will come first and restore all things. May it be that these things, these exciting things, can spur us on. When Elijah first spoke to Israel on Carmel, he called out, How long halt ye between two opinions? The hope of Israel is our hope, brethren and sisters. May we be amongst those who respond, Yahweh, the Lord, he is our God.